be working with. Um, so um, I'm going to give a little introduction to to Michelle and her thinking, and then Hannah will um, take over. So um, Michelle, this is sort of my character profile of how I experienced Michelle as a thinker. Um, I think Michelle is one of the most incisive critics and patient readers that I know, um, which is a really wonderful and I think necessary combination for the kind of um, political theoretical work that she does, which combines many different traditions and kind of holds them in balance at once without um, assimilating the, the um, vocabulary of one to the other. Um, this seminar also would not exist without her. She has she is in the syllabus. She's in uh, your breakout room. She's in the spirit of this question, the family question, um, which she approaches from so many angles. Um, once um, we were talking in advance of a presentation that she was going to give on, on family abolition, and I kind of ventriloquized what I imagined to be some of the potential resistances amongst an uninitiated audience, but also some of my own, um, uh, some of my own ignorance upon um, arriving at the topic. And I, you know, said that maybe it's hard for some people that the only thing that provides them with a sense of relief and security amongst the, the struggles of living, um, however pure or contingent would be would become an object of criticism, that being the family. Um, and, and she said that, you know, the project is not about begrudging anyone um, their ways of surviving the world or about maligning uh, kind of provisional structures of support that, that you come up with as a way to, um, to uh, deal with the challenge of, of being alive, but about, but about making the world in general more livable so that these cycles of social reproduction that force us back into disempowered solutions um, can give way to a more sustainable commons. And I think that's really in the spirit of the De La Costa um, and also very much uh, foregrounded in, in Michelle's essay and endnotes, which is on um, the, the um, topic of family abolition and which I really recommend everyone read. I actually think we are reading it. Um, I think it's, yeah, we will be reading it. So um, you'll get there. Um, so um, yeah, so I think this, this makes her really a fantastic uh, fit for the materials that we're reading today. Um, she also, I think, does a really good job of combining a deep historical focus with a, a active desire for, for the realization of, of new social formations in the future. Um, and so this, this dual kind of timeline, I think, is also sort of reflected in the materials that we read um, for today, the one a little bit more historical, the other a little bit more forward projecting. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think Michelle's work, whether it's speculative fiction, which Hannah's going to read some of the um, publications and accolades, um, but Michelle just published a book of speculative fiction that's on the, uh, it's an oral history of a uh, future uh, uh, commune um, that has uh, ceased to exist, but will exist uh, in the future. Um, she's a practicing psychoanalyst and she's a sociologist and historian of social movements, uh, particularly in New York City. Um, I would say all these things, including her friendship, which I feel very lucky to um, to to benefit from um, is really about coming at this problem, the family problem, from every possible angle, um, with love and patience, uh, and also a relentless investment in in realizing something more livable um, in the present while remaining committed to to abolition as the horizon that we um, that we're working toward. Um, so I will just say thank you so much, Michelle, for, for everything so far and pass it over to Hannah, who will give a few more uh, details on Michelle. Thank you so much, Wen. So Wendy speaks for both of us when she describes this quality of thought and feeling together and on behalf of the other. That's always in evidence when being with and learning from Michelle. So it's a pleasure to describe just, you know, um, 
the the very on paper sort of stunning breadth of work um, Wendy took the sort of deeper feelingful, but I just want to echo it. So Dr. Michelle O'Brien completed a PhD at NYU in sociology and is a therapist in private practice in New York City. She's the author of numerous essays and articles, one of which we'll read in just a few weeks in EndNotes, and I'll drop it in the chat now in case you can't wait. I will say that Michelle is a sociologist by training. She's also one of the most deft, uh, rigorous uh, historians of the family um, and the one I learned the most from in my own work. So thank you, Michelle, again. Uh, and yes, Michelle's also, and this is what I mean by the kind of like stunning breadth of uh, of work, the author of Everything for Everyone, uh, which is just out from common notions. There are a ton of great events that are coming up. Um, most uh, germane maybe to us is that the Psychosocial Foundation will be hosting a release celebration and roundtable with Michelle and her co-author and also someone who's familiar to all of you, Dr. Laura Shihai who has spoken to us about Fanon uh, and maybe other surprise guests to be determined, but I just dropped that link in the chat. Uh, and so additionally, Michelle writes on gender freedom and communist theory and brings that to two editorial projects. One is PINKO, uh, is part of the ed editorial collective of PINKO which is a magazine of freedom, and also, as you all know, is a core organizer of this seminar and an associate editor at Parapraxis, the new magazine associated with this foundation that we're so excited to bring to you all later this fall. So I'll get out of the way because I want to hear from Michelle, um, and I'm sure you all do too. And when Michelle is done with her presentation of about 30 to 35 minutes, we'll do as we always have, which is have questions for Michelle. And then we'll turn to breakout groups after a five minute respite. And then we'll all come back and, and ask Michelle some more questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Michelle O'Brien. It's such an honor to learn with you and from you today and every day. Uh, thank you both, Wendy and Hannah. Those are um, far greater introductions than I deserve. And you were both very generous. So, um, uh, and thank you, you two have been wonderful to work with as co-organizers of the seminar. And uh, thanks as well to the facilitators leading the breakout rooms. Um, so according to the online syllabus for the seminar, today's theme is social reproduction and rebellion. I'll begin by talking about social reproduction theory as a major subfield of Marxist theory and uh, current dominant trends in Marxist feminism. Then I'll outline the present texts, Alexander Kolontai and Mariosa Dalla Costa, with particular attention to how they use moments of mass rebellion to understand social reproduction in the place of the family and circuits of capitalist accumulation. I'll continue looking at how they suggest that gender and sexuality are being remade as women and children contest the private household and prescribe gender roles within context of broader working class insurgency. I'll use this to make some tentative statements about psychoanalysis, the family and political change. Uh, I've been asked to speak for, would, would it be possible to mute uh, other people? Um, I've been asked to speak for about 30 minutes, and uh, in keeping with some of the feedback on the seminar last week, I'm going to try to make for a very accessible presentation, uh, so covering some of the basics of social reproduction theory. Before I discuss social reproduction, I want to emphasize the immediate, personal, and accessible character of this topic. Phrases like social reproduction, capitalist accumulation, or even the private household have particular technical meanings in Marxism and Marxist feminism. However, they all correspond to direct personal experiences that we all share in a capitalist society. All of us, with rare exception, grew up in private households organized around the family. Our families functioned not only as social relationships and raising us as children, Families in our capitalist society, almost universally, are always ways that people manage shared economic resources, allocate and distribute unpaid work with the home, and made decisions about work. Families have to figure out how to reproduce themselves in the capitalist society. 
some in the household needs someone in the household needs to make enough money to pay the rent to buy food to access basic necessities and the main way this happens is through finding a paid job for someone outside the home our family members play some role in enabling that person to make it to their job Families also raise their children conscious of their future prospects, making decisions when possible about education and child rearing, attentive to some dimension of labor market conditions. Families in these senses are part of the reproduction of capitalist society. In thinking back on our own upbringing, we can think about how was food prepared in your household? Who washed the clothes? Where did the money for basic necessities come from? Who made the decisions about where the family would live? How all of this sorted out is uh, essential to understand the family, your family, as a system of gender and sexuality, as a site of power and struggle, and as an economic link in capitalist society. We all have immediate, direct, and personal experiences with what Marxist feminists call social reproduction and its relevance for thinking about gender, sexuality, the family problem, and even psychoanalysis. This is even true for those people who are raised outside of families, which could be potentially uh, interesting to talk about if we have time. With this framing, I encourage people to approach this topic not as an abstract technical field, but as something crucial for talking about and understanding our lives. As we shall see, this connects to the unusual character of these readings. Next, about social reproduction. In the 1970s, through the feminist movement, large numbers of women challenged the gender role expectations within their families, the injunction to form families, and the unpaid work expected of women. For those women with ties to Marxist and socialist movements, they found powerful resonance and tension between their Marxist commitment to understanding and critiquing capitalism and their challenge of gender roles. Marx was most articulate in examining waged work, the work people do at paid jobs for capitalist enterprises. Given the racism and sexism of the later socialist movement, the unpaid work of enslaved people or women in the private household got much less attention. Marxist feminists in the 1970s began to argue forcefully that the unpaid work of housewives should be understood alongside labor struggle in formal workplaces. Sometimes they called, they argued it should be considered a parallel and separate form of oppression. They, and these, these people that argued this were called dual systems theorists. And sometimes they argued that gender oppression within the private household should be understand, understood as an integrated part of capitalist society as a whole, so-called unitary theorists. As we see with Dalla Costa's essay, these debates often included positions on one now quite esoteric and obscure question of Marxist theory. Is the unpaid labor of women value producing in a strict Marxist sense? Marxist theory means something very specific and relatively confusing by the word value. Unfortunately, in these debates, the political stakes of that became known as the household labor debate. Uh, these political stakes were rarely made explicit. Though I disagree with Della Costa that unpaid work in the private household is value producing in a strict Marxist sense, I share with her political intent with this argument that unpaid, women's unpaid labor matters in how we understand capitalism, the working class and class struggle. In the particular context of 1970s socialist politics, asserting a form of work was value producing was the only way Marxist feminists could try to convince sexist Marxists that it was a form of work that should be taken seriously. Dalla Costa writes on page 283 of our, PD, uh, um, of our PDF, the core political principle, the motivated otherwise arcane claims about value, quote, as long as housewives are considered external to the class, the class struggle at every moment and any point is impeded, frustrated, and unable to find scope for its action. End quote. Housewives, she argues, must be understood as a part of the working class. Leaving that aside, by the 1980s, unitary theorists have begun to put together what became known as social reproduction theory. After a long period when feminist theory generally shunned Marxism through the late 80s and 1990s, in the last decade, social reproduction theory has made a major revival. 
Social reproduction theory argues that the va that a vast amount of paid and unpaid work is required to reproduce the workforce, the people who make it to their jobs. This unpaid work is done in the home in the form of cooking, laundry, cleaning, gestating and giving birth, raising children, caring for people while they are sick. This is also paid work in certain service industries and state institutions like childcare, schools, hospitals and laundry businesses. This work is feminized. It is done mostly by women. It is seen by many as somehow naturally linked to womanhood and is often underpaid or unpaid partially due to its gendered mark. Social reproduction theory argues these forms of work are essential as links to how capitalist society as a whole is reproduced. The private household is one important link in the chain of reproducing the workforce. Family life is shaped in turn by available jobs outside the home. Gender in the family, social reproduction theory argues, can be helpful, helpfully understood by how they play a role in the functioning of capitalist society. Social reproduction theory has moved beyond the narrowness of debates about the housewife to grapple with paid labor in the home, such as by domestic workers, and when similar tasks of reproducing human life happen outside the home. One of the quite legitimate critiques made of Dalla Costa and other Marxist feminists in the 1970s, which is the housewife as a figure of unpaid labor, didn't really think about how black women have long worked outside the home, including do the household labor under white women during slavery and later as domestic workers, including in the 1970s. Social reproduction theory, though I would argue pretty uneven and limited on some important questions of race, takes paid domestic workers seriously these days in, in, a, while, in a way that earlier white feminists did not. Kolontai and Della Costa are writing in very different contexts, each before social reproduction theory was coined or consolidated as a current of Marxist feminism. They both share, however, a strong political orientation to seeing the unpaid work of housewives as an essential part of the working class and capitalist society. They each prefigure many of the core elements of what became social reproduction theory. However, both these essays go well beyond quite a bit of current social reproduction theory. I would argue that they're able to do so because they each are writing during periods of mass working class rebellion. In each case, this rebellion was initially dominated by men working in factories, but was being taken up in new and extraordinary ways by housewives and women workers. These contexts of rebellion enabled these two authors to forge what were at times novel insights, pushing our understanding of gender and work far beyond what otherwise would have been possible. Kolontai was the only member of the central, uh, the only female member of the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party during the Russian Revolution in 1917. She played multiple roles in the revolutionary government including heading up a women's commission and heading up various welfare and social service programs. The Bolsheviks were generally much more supportive of women's rights than any existing government was in the world at the time. They quickly implemented universal suffrage for women, made divorce and abortion easily available and instituted full legal equality for women. As well as the Bolsheviks were waging a civil war against counter-revolutionary forces, they identified the desperate need to mobilize large numbers of women to work outside the household. Lenin and the other Bolsheviks initially valued Kolontai for offering a bold and powerful vision to in involve women fully in the revolution. Kolontai saw the unpaid work of housewives as central to the subordination of women. Gender equality, she argued, could be won by, uh, won by transforming unpaid work to collect paid work. She was inspired by efforts Russian women undertook during the Revolution and Civil War for their own survival, forming collective canteens in the midst of mass food shortages, setting up collective childcare centers, trying to reduce the amount of cleaning expected around the home, she, Kolontai successfully convinced the new communist government to support these efforts at collectivizing household labor. She argued that scaled up and universalized throughout society, 
These would inevitably lead to the destruction of the private household as an economic unit, the end of the family as a space of compulsion and domination, and the possibility of full gender equality. Here, her theory and logic of the struggle happening were interconnected, each enabling and bolstering each other. Kolontai recognized correctly the radical alternative to the family emerging in women's particular participation in mass rebellion. Riding in the midst of struggle, Kolontai glimpsed the possibility of sexual liberation, a new sexual morality, and a fundamental transformation of gender possible through communist revolution. Ultimately, the progressive gender politics of the Russian Revolution were defeated. Soon after the Civil War ended, and with it the immediate desperation of survival, Kolontai's fellow Bolsheviks withdrew their support for her project of overcoming the private family. Kolontai briefly joined efforts at resisting the bureaucratic consolidation of party rule at the cost of working class popular participation, but ultimately she quietly joined in the ensuing counter revolution. As Stalin consolidated power, Russia's pol progressive policies around abortion and divorce were rolled back. By the, by the time the women's liberation movement emerged at the end of the 1960s, few knew anything about the bold moves for women's equality pursued by Kolontai and early revolutionary Russian women. Now to Dala Costa. Dala Costa's draft, drafted her essay amidst another wave of working class rebellion, Italy's hot autumn. Between 1968 and 1972, Italy's industrial workforce was striking in mass, occupying factories across the industrial centers of Northern Italy, briefly posing what appeared to be many to be a threat of full-scale communist insurrection. By 1972, these rebellions were spilling into society as a whole. Students shut down most of the country's school system, demanding major reforms. In large numbers, working class women began refusing to pay household bills, refusing to pay the full price for groceries they took, and refusing to pay for transit fares. These auto reductions, as they were called, extended well into the economic crisis of the mid-1970s, leading Italy to have a much longer period of rebellion than most of their European counterparts. In the midst of large numbers of women, including housewives, simultaneously challenging their husbands, existing socialist organizations, and capitalist businesses, Dalla Costa was making an argument for how integral women's rebellion is to overthrowing capitalism. Capitalism, she persuasively and in my mind correctly argues, creates divides between different sectors of society and the working class. Dividing, for example, waged men's work outside the home from unwaged women's work in the home. Working class rebellion must necessarily bridge across these sectors, ultimately seeking to destroy the divisions between them altogether. She shares with Kolontai an astute reading of household labor, of the place of the private family within capitalism, and the role of women's struggle in driving forward a broader class struggle. Like Kolontai, writing the Mist of Rebellion helped her forge new theoretical insights. Dalla Costa clearly and persuasively argued that the capitalist form of wage labor organizes the work and lives of not only of the worker, but also the family, including the unwaged labor done within the home. In this sense, unpaid and paid work are connected together in the gender relation within capitalist society through the institution of the family. She writes, quote, since Marx, it has been clear that capital rules and develops through the wage. That is that the foundation of capitalist society was the wage labor and his or her direct exploitation. What has been neither clear nor assumed by the organizations of the working class movement is that precisely through the wage has the exploitation of the non-wage labor been organized. This exploitation has been even more effective because the, lack, because the lack of a wage hit it. That is, the wage commanded a larger amount of labor than appeared in factory bargaining. Where women are concerned, their labor appears to be a personal service outside of capital." End quote. 
As a side, in the English speaking world, this essay was distributed as co-authored by Selma James, a British Marxist feminist, with another section not in this version and definitely primarily authored by James. James likely wrote many of the footnotes you read here. Later, Delacoste and James had conflict, including over the authorship of this essay. This version is the best we are able to find, and it was likely largely written by Delacosta. Delacosta, however, differs from Kolotai in one crucial respect, on the question of work itself. Kolotai shared with the entire working class movement of her day, including all anarchists, socialists, communists, and other working class revolutionaries, a vision that communism could be won through a worker's society, through the generalization of the experience of work to everyone and a government and society based on working class rule. It is becoming parts of the waged working class in a society run by the working class that will free women. Notably, this is quite different from Marx's initial vision of communist communism being the abolition of wage labor and class society. Uh, one of the new elements that emerged in the rebellions of the late 1960s were mass critiques of work itself as a capitalist institution. Counter to the persistent role of wage labor in the Soviet Union, revolutionaries were beginning to argue that overcoming capitalism must necessarily be the overcoming of waged work as a domain of social life. This is reflected in Dalacosta's argument. Demands for wages for housework, she argues, are ultimately made towards the intent of refusing work altogether. She insists repeatedly that work refusal, the overcoming of work, is central to the project of working class emancipation. While most social reproduction theorists are more like Kolontai and not being very critical of work itself, other recent family abolitionists like Sophie Lewis or my own work share Dalla Acosta's critique of work. What does this have to do with psychoanalysis? Here as a clinician, I'll try to speak to other clinicians who might be present, though I think adjusting the language is broadly relevant to everyone here. In a very concrete clinical way, social reproduction theory helps think about a whole dimension of our patient's upbringing and present family configuration. There are quite a number of quite specific dimensions that shape patient psyches in both classical writings and con the contemporary clinic. How, who did the housework while the patient was growing up? In Freud's writings, servants, maids, and governesses make frequent appearances. In non-affluent heterosexual households, children likely grew up seeing their mothers or maternal figure do a huge amount of household labor. Observing the distribution of household labor shapes a child's grasp, gender, and sexual difference, the particular logic of Oedipal conflict, and the formation of superego and ego ideals. Who worked outside the home? In the mid to late 20th century, gender relations transformed dramatically as more and more mothers went to work outside the home with young children in daycare. Not outrageously, commentators suggested that this may play a role in many people today having significantly more flexible relationships to gender and sexual identity as they had witnessed a breaking down of one set of rigid gender norms while they were growing up. How did the family manage money? Depending on a child's class position, how their family managed, talked about, and made decisions about accumulated wealth, burdensome debt, or periods of unemployment could all play major roles in shaping a child's psyche. As both traumas and as bases for various kinds of neurosis, the child's observations about their family's money stress or money secrets will definitely play out in analysis. As these questions are ones that social reproduction theory has thought a great deal about politically, Marxist feminists are arguably the most extensive and thoughtful treatment of explaining why and how family life has changed over the course of capitalist development. But these two authors, I argue, go beyond most social reproduction theory. By thinking about these issues in the middle of mass rebellions, they see the potential of rapid dramatic transformations in gender and, and sexuality, which has implications in analytic work. 
Kolontai imagines that the deliberate breakdown of a private family under communism could give incredible new opportunities for genuine love, healthy sexuality, and gender and sexual freedom. She imagines the basic developmental role of the family would instead be taken by the worker's state. Just as canteens will replace private kitchens and skilled teams will replace unpaid cleaning, even in childcare, quote, the worker state will come to replace the family. Society will gradually take upon itself all the tasks that before the revolution fell to the individual parents, end quote. If this process continued, it would have fundamentally remade the basic coordinates of Oedipal conflict, childhood development, and required a rethinking of the Freudian model of the psyche. The horrors often cited of Romanian orphanages need not have been the only outcome. Kolontai envisioned child rearing practices that integrated the parents, skilled workers, and the broader care from comrades and society as a whole. She writes on page 98, quote, in place of the individual and egoistic family, a great universal family of workers will develop in which all the workers, men and women, will above all be comrades. This is what relations between men and women in the communist society will be like. These new relations will ensure for humanity all the joys of love unknown in the commercial society of a love that is free and based on true social equality of the partners." End quote. I share with Kolontai a sense that a free society would necessarily be one where the responsibility for children is shared between parents and broader, broader communal relations of care. At rare historical moments, psychoanalysts have begun to think about such relations, but that project is largely left undone. Dalla Costa identifies something beyond the narrow roles of the family form already present in women enthusiastically joining the working class rebellion. I am particularly struck by when she describes housewives entering collective struggle and encountering their family members and their neighbors on the streets as comrades. This fundamentally transforms their potential relationships to each other. On page 285, she writes, a common solidarity against an uncommon, a common solidarity against a common form of labor. In the same way, women must stop meeting their husbands and children only as wife and mother. That is at mealtime after they have come home from the outside world. Every place of struggle outside the home, precisely because every sphere of capitalist organization presupposes the home, offers a chance for attack by women, factory meetings, neighborhood meetings, student assemblies. Each of them are legitimate places for women's struggle when women can encounter and confront men. men ver women versus men, if you like, but as individuals rather than mother, father, son, daughter, with all the possibilities, the, this others to explode outside Outside of the house, the contradictions, the frustrations, the capital has wanted to implode within the family. I would argue that she is pointing to the antagonistic dimension here of what is actually a very common experience in mass rebellions. Old social relations and roles break down and the opportunity to encounter each other as people in radically new ways emerge. This is also a beautiful and succinct description of a dimension of how we can understand the very purpose of the psychoanalytic process. By working through our transference neurosis through which we encounter everyone as if they were our family members, we remake and rediscover ourselves. In that process, we learn to encounter again our analysts, the people in our lives, and even our family members as individuals, as comrades, as people we are able to fully see for the first time. The promise, the offer of psychoanalysis is to learn to relate to others beyond the baggage, the accumulated trauma and the desperate agendas that typically 
drive our lives. On the other side of the transference, the other side of our fantasy, we can encounter each other fresh, to confront each other, to fight each other, to love each other as the people we are. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for that incredibly moving end as well. Um, so as is how we do it here, we will now take questions for Michelle and to think with Michelle, as well as these two texts um, for about 15 minutes. Alex, go for it. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Michelle, so much. That was so incredibly comprehensive. I don't know how you covered so much ground in, in such a short period. Um, I have a question about the Kalantai text. So first, I was wondering what you make of how she thinks about the historical development of the family. Does she see the changes to the family under capitalism as progressive or as like to some extent liberating for women? Um, and then, because I know you you yourself have written about transition, I was wondering what you think about how she's thinking about transition. Because as you said, she is in a moment of like transition. Is it is it like the development of the productive forces will lead to the family withering away? Is is how she puts it at some point, or is it something that the government has to implement, or is it? Um, the collective experiments that inspire her is there like an element of prefiguration i wonder what you make of like the history but also the transition to communism like a lot of thinkers writing in the middle of revolutions kolontai says many uh, slightly contradictory things uh, i mean i think she's a more consistent thinker than most but she was writing in the midst of rapidly changing political conditions and trying to make sense of that. And her writing was also polemical. It was designed mostly to enlist and inspire women to put pressure on the Bolshevik leadership around pursuing particular political gains. And so, you know, I don't think there's quite a systematic theory on all these questions, but there is across her writing actually a fair amount of consistency. I would say that I haven't found her to be a super coherent theorist of the history of the family under capitalism. She shares with many, many other people of the day a sense that women working outside the home is a basis for social equality and that the sort of pressures of capitalist development drawing women into the workforce as being a progressive advance that then needs to be taken further. She's also writing in a dominant peasant society and in a society where large numbers of women are definitely not working outside the home, where many peasant families sent sons into the cities to work, but kept daughters at home to continue doing household labor is my understanding of it. And that this played out in urban contexts where the sort of degree of proletarianization of women was widely varied and extremely uneven. So she more so than theorists in Germany or England really saw the perception Assistance of the housewife, not the achievement of the housewife as a normative, stable family norm, you know, that, that emerged in the end of the 19th century, but the persistence of the housewife due to the persistence of feudal social relations, it, which is a, a very different history of the housewife. And so all of that is sort of crashing together as happens in the uneven and combined development of Russia at the time, right? You have peasant housewives, working class housewives, women in the workforce, all of these things really mixed up together. Um, in terms of transition, I would say that Kolontai shared with a number of Bolsheviks a sense that the self-activity of the working class, the deliberate intervention through state policy and the development of productive forces were all consistent with each other. For a few short years there in the middle of the revolution, as huge numbers of working class people were in like a mass democratic rebellion before the consolidation of a, of a bureaucratic state, I guess we could say, um, during that moment, like what large numbers of working class people, in this case, women were doing, what the state was proposing and what needed to happen all seemed to be potentially compatible. And so it didn't 
they, I think none of them had a theory of transition that could necessarily parse the differences between those. And partially because of that, I think they, they're, you know, they were not well equipped to sort of recognize the implications of bureaucratic consolidation that happens later. And so for Kolontai, these active self-initiated survival strategies of women being like, we are starving, let's throw our food together in a collective canteen and feed our neighborhood, were happening concurrently with the Bolsheviks being like, canteens, that's what we need, which were happening concurrently with this being a means of drawing large numbers of women into the workforce to become a part of the revolutionary struggle in a way that served Bolshevik interests during the Civil War. And that all of these things more or less fit together in a way that the later period of, say, capitalist development in the 70s and 80s, drawing large numbers of women into the workforce in the service of capital, which Jala Costa spots, she doesn't know what's going to happen, but she spots that women working under capital will not be a progressive advance. And Kolontai doesn't know that in the same way. Um, so yes, I, I, I think these things don't have to be teased out in the same way in Kolontai's thinking because they're all happening concurrently. Yeah. Should I try to answer Madeline's question or? Please, that would be great. Well, I, I'm not one that thinks, I don't think contemporary social reproduction theory is all that coherent. And some critiques, critics, people who are hostile to social reproduction theory point this out a lot, but they're hostile. I'm not hostile to it. Like, I think it's really useful to look at all these different forms of work that happen in society, paid and unpaid, underpaid, unionized, whatever, like having to do with bodies, having to do with physical objects. There's so many ways of parsing the distinction. You know, healthcare and education are two of the largest sectors in the advanced capitalist world right now. And like those are largely feminized sectors and we really need to understand that. And similarly, the household continues to play a really important role in um, capitalist society, even in the absence of housewives, right? So we need social reproduction theory. We need a way of theorizing all these things together, but there is no way to cleanly conceptually parse social reproductive labor from other forms of labor. Every distinction that anyone comes up with actually falls apart if you lean on it very much. Waged and unwaged doesn't quite do it bodies and commodities doesn't do it, value producing and non-value producing doesn't do it, service industry versus manufacturing doesn't do it. Like all these distinctions don't fall, don't quite add up. And that I would argue is because gender doesn't quite add up. That social reproduction theory is trying to think about the feminized, feminizing force of the division of labor. So it's not that these tasks are then like, you know, are then, like assigned to women because women are associated with these things, that actually there's a dialectical relationship happening between the emergent, the reproduction of what we think of as gender and the gender difference and the division of labor. The other piece I would add to that is violence, that the other major dimension of gender is how violence is organized within the household, within on the street, within society at large. And that social reproduction theory, the, its biggest failure, I think, is inadequately grasping the intensity and severity of, of violence as a shaping force in gender relations. And in this way, like I sort of think of I sort of think of the fundamental political contradiction, like ideal. Mm, theoretical tension of our era is in trying to think what has been called Afro-pessimism and Marxism alongside each other. The world is both a global organization in the division of labor and a global organization in the distribution of violence, and that these are the same system, right? They are literally the same, like they are not separate institutions, like, but Marxists historically 
have really like when Marx is writing, work was incredibly violent. Like it's not that he is wage work in the factories was incredibly violent. Like this was long before OSHA, right? He was reading about men who would get mutilated constantly on their jobs. But that isn't integrated into the core of Marxist theory. And that thinking about what the implications are of gratuitous mass violence is like one of the great contributions of Afro-pessimism. Similarly, like being a trans woman is partially about being excluded from kinds of work, but it's also about being subject to certain kinds of violence in your life. And race and class are obviously central to thinking about that. So this is, a, this is you know, we need a theory that does this and we don't have it yet. Social reproduction theory, I think, has uh, is very powerful and very useful, and I certainly see my work as in its legacy. I think it um, the fact that gender at its heart is not a conceptually coherent category means that social reproductive labor ultimately can't be a coherent category. And similarly, I think it's been a little overly dominated by like a Trotskyist informed, narrow, analytic Marxist political economy, and has sort of lacked from adequately really integrating in a more dialectical way its critics. So like, the encounter between social reproduction theory and black feminism, for example, has often been very fraught. And there's just a tremendous amount they can learn from each other. Ashley Borer wrote a great book on this, but learning from each other requires thinking beyond as the sort of ex existing categories that people deploy. And I think there's a real resistance to doing that in some Marxist circles. Um, yeah, oh, looking back on the question. Yeah, so, but social reproduction theory is enormously powerful for locating the family in the history of capitalist development and thinking about the role of the family in the reproduction of capitalist society. My own research on family abolition, which you all read, tries to bridge that with thinking about the place of sexual deviancy in anti-capitalist rebellion and working class rebellion and class formation. That the work, that the working class has always been both families and those excluded from families. And like, we have to think these alongside each other in dialectical tension in order to make sense of the history of the working class. Um, yeah. Other questions? We have time for one or two more before we take our short break. And of course, we can come back on the other side of breakout groups, having spent some time more with the text to come back to M Michelle again. But any questions raised? Great, Abby, go for it. Thank you. Um, this is a little bit of a half-formed thought, so <laughs> apologies for that in advance. Um, but first, Michelle, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it was really wonderful. And particularly, the I mean, I'm not a clinician, um, and, and yet the moments when you were speaking particularly about like clinical insights. Um, I took like 17 pages of notes and it was just extraordinarily helpful. So thank you. Um, I was thinking as you were talking um, about um, Dalla Costa, about a classic essay by um, the feminist philosopher Susan Bordeaux um, called The Reproduction of Femininity. Um, and I was thinking about how do we think psychoanalysis alongside Marxist feminism um, and more social reproduction theory. Um, this, you know, this broad question that you're posing for us. And, and Bordeaux talks about, um, she reads symptomatically like key figures of, of women at different periods. So starting with Freud, Freud's time, she's talking about um, the hysteric as the sort of paradigmatic um, and then moves into the fifties and starts talking about the agoraphobic um, and then moves up to like the eighties and early nineties and starts talking about the anorexic. Um, and so here is my like completely half formed thought was I was as as I was reading this, I was like, can we read the housewife as a symptom in some in some way? Is that is that a generative kind of question to ask? I, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there and see if that was something worth thinking with in your. Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Um, I mean, one way that I would place at Alex's paper on hysteria, Alex Colston, uh, hysterics and obsessionals and sort of thinking about the hysteric social bond is really quite relevant to this. But I, I, I think I am certainly of a theoretical tradition in psychoanalysis that sees hysteria as persistent. 
as a widespread phenomenon and not as a sort of 19th century anachronism. And I've slowly discovered that that is an extreme minority position amongst practicing psychoanalysts. Um, and I think Lacan was very right that hysteria is the is the discovery of hysteria is a way of making sense of universal dimensions of the human relationship to language, power, the body. Hysteria is where we begin to understand how human knowledge works, uh, or really core dimensions of it. And I think this is absolutely true. And that there are key features of hysteria that are inherent to being a feminized person in a gendered division of labor and in a gendered organization of violence in society. And the contradictions of that, like what does it mean to be constantly terrorized by the people you love? It's a really good question. It's kind of an inherent question to being a woman in the world, right? And like, uh, there's a lot to say in thinking about that, right? These kind of ambivalent attachments that the history of thinking about hysteria is a way of trying to parse that. Um, I think the, you know, we, there was a lot of writing in the 1960s about the sort of horrible fate of the housewife. The sort of housewife is an isolated, depressed figure and collective action and feminism being her sort of mode of liberation. And that writing, I think, very much is sort of using a whole set of psychoanalytic categories, the psychoanalytic insights and how they parse it. And they're trying to think about the housewife as a symptom of the gendered order of capitalist society and the private family as a sort of focal point of capitalist neurosis. Um, and, you know, like, I, I think a, a very interesting question then, and Colin ties, you know, romanticizing of the worker state uh, is the sort of there's a counterpart to that, which is we've seen the generalization of the family in the capitalist society. It's sort of socialization into commodity exchange. And how does that, like, what, what does that mean for psychic and gendered organization in our age now? Like both the proliferation of trans identities, I'm trans, most of my patients are trans, trans liberation is really central to my thinking. And on the other hand, like proliferation of kind of fascist imaginaries around the family. And in my, in parapraxis, I've been trying to think these things alongside each other. Um, kind of how they're both symptomatic of the kind of disappearance of the housewife in, in some really key ways. Because um, the housewife is the counterpart to the patriarch, right? To the sort of organizing father, the symbolic father that's able to organize the, the psychic and social and sexual world coherently. Amazing. So we're Thank going- you so much. We have a bunch of questions in the chat. I've written them down. Mikalena, we'll also come back to you. We'll take a five minute break now, just so we have enough time in the breakout groups. Um, so it'll be five minutes. So, um, and Maureen has added one too, uh, which is a lovely comment. So we'll take a five minute break. Um, if you're staying for breakout groups, awesome. If you're not, if you might leave now, even if you want to come back in 40 minutes or so, that's fine. Um, and I'll put you all into groups uh, and in at uh, 202 Eastern Standard Time, you'll get the invitation uh, to go join them. Um, okay, so don't go very far, please. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all so much for going to breakout groups and coming back so swiftly. That was awesome. Um, I'm happy to hear about, and I think we all are, what was coming up in the rooms. And also I have the questions still uh, from before as well, if, if there's a lull and we wanna turn back to them. I'll just open it up to all of you who got to go into breakout rooms today. We can also have a discussion that isn't just questions to put that out there. Of course, yes, we can have we can have an open discussion too.
Okay. Um, I'm happy to throw something out there, um, following on a bit from the group discussion um, and following on from the question I asked about Engels last week, where you know Engels gave this like long history of the patriarchal household and what he calls monogamy, but maybe didn't specify so much what the capitalist family is. And, and these readings really did that. Um, like Dalla Costa, especially, you know, it's about the wage. And this allows her to spool out this analysis of how the capitalist family kind of generates gender in this way by, by excluding women from the wage. But then she is like having to be at pains to say, we're not just calling for inclusion in the wage. That's not the solution we're looking for. Um, anyway, in the, in the group discussion, we were talking a bit about homeworking and like the, the post Fordist family um, I think Angela Metropolis writes about this as like the, the indistinction between the time of work and the time of life. Um, so, I mean, it, it, is the wage still how we want to specify what the capitalist family is? And then also what, if, if Dalla Costa is defining it in this somewhat Fordist way of like the wage and exclusion from the wage, what does that mean now in like post Fordist working situations where maybe you're working from home, you don't have this clear distinction between when you're working and when you're not working. And then didn't really get so far as to think about this, but what then does this mean psychoanalytically um, in terms of say the discussion before about femininity, uh, about hysteria, so-called, um, you know, what what's producing femininity, is it, exclusion from the wage is it something else about the capitalist family um yeah just a whole bunch of questions really to throw out but yeah thanks for the amazing presentation and discussion Do others want to join in and we can stack questions or else maybe stick with this idea of how how do we want to describe the family now in relation to the wage? Michelle, what would your preference be? Um, that uh, it seems like taking more comments that didn't seem like a, like a full on direct question to me, but a sort of rumination on linked themes. So. I can share that um, one of the things that came up in our breakout room was um, how the readings kind of bring up this tension between um, the, I don't even know what word to use, like <laughs> the individual, the subject as somebody who is part of a social group and who has, um, you know, particular identities that attach to them because of their position and, you know, the singularity of the individual, um, particularly in the context of psychoanalysis. And we were interested in, in how the concept of the individual showed up in, um, in Dalla Costa and the way that individuality now feels like not, not such a super Marxist <laughs> um, value, or it seems like something that we're we're constantly confronted with like the, how how great it is to be an individual in neoliberalism, but um, yeah, I guess that's that's just another theme to add to the pile. Please, Alex, Alex, and then Alex. I guess kind of um, following up on Alex's comment, um, I would love to hear more of your thoughts about the use of the individual as it shows up in this work and then um, the work of Afro-pessimists that, that you had referenced in your, in your lecture, um, engaging with not only this idea of the family, but um, the liberation and abolition of the family. 
um, and the limits of the social um, reproduction theory in light of um, the ways that it doesn't totally take into account um, some of the core core issues in Afro pessimism. Right. And should we get Wendy also on the table and then we can maybe move through the the many themes? Yeah, um, so um, this is kind of a speculative question and, and maybe you don't have an answer, but um, recalling a, a kind of like moment of reflection and humility um, in which Freud understood that psychoanalysis was not something that that was really for the working class to the extent that it couldn't um, help the problems posed by poverty and, and even went maybe so far as to say that it was kind of a response or solution or, or um, a treatment for a specifically bourgeois subject. I wonder in the imagination of these kind of uh, transformed uh, models of, of eating and living and childcare, et cetera, um, what, what um, something like psychoanalysis or, or psychotherapeutic treatment looks like in, in uh, like beyond the horizon of, of um, uh, the abolition of, of um, you know, private, life um and uh yeah if if as a um practicing analyst you you have thoughts about that well now there's a lot of themes out there so uh, I'll, I'll i guess i'll just talk for a minute i um i think one whole set of questions is about how the world has changed since dalla costa is writing and you all will read a piece where i sort of make a few speculative comments about that and i've been thinking about it a lot i i don't find necessarily fortis post fortis to be the most helpful periodization but i acknowledge there's something like that happening right the sort of organization of the working class family uh, coded as white uh, around the housewife and then breaking down into this era of whatever sexual and economic chaos to the or, uh, on some level that people imagine that way. Um, and it, there's certainly been huge transformations in how social reproduction functions, in uh, how people make choices about their family, about you know the formation of private households. There's been major changes in dismantling social welfare programs, in you know a kind of sustained attack on organized labor, and the kind of normative family form that was really a part of this previous era is now just a fantasy ideal in people's minds. I mean, it, it, it doesn't describe anyone's private household now. Arguably, uh, it never really described everyone, but it was an ideal that people could really partially obtain a section of the white working class. So there's that whole set of changes that's happening that Dalla Costa um, doesn't foresee, right? She doesn't parse that, but she does say very clearly that were women to be fully incorporated into the workforce, it would not be freedom. And that is correct. She sees that in a way that Kolontai and Ingalls don't, right? She, she recognizes that if the family and wage labor are both simultaneously a part of capitalist society, then moving from one to the other might or get better in some ways, but it is not freedom. Uh, and that what the movement was demanding was not women's equality in the workforce. It was the overthrow of the workforce as a, as a social form. And that is as relevant now as it's ever been, even if she didn't know that women would be general, like generally incorporated into the workforce in such large numbers. The stuff about the individual, it's very complex. Uh, and there's so much theory around this. And uh, there's so much thinking about this. And it gets into a very high level of abstraction very quickly. And I have things to say about it, but it's difficult sort of bridging the things I have to say into the extremely ornate, sophisticated theoretical registers that a lot of people spend time on around this. Like, uh, and so I'm, I'm hesitant to do it too much. But what I would say is that um, 
Marx at one point says something along the lines of, I'm trying to remember the quote, I think it's in the German ideology that, that in capitalism, people relate people relate to each other mediated by things, by commodity exchange, and that under communism, people would relate to each other directly as people, that, that social relations would be direct. Um, if anyone can find the quote, I would love to hear it. And I think there's a real truth to that, that there's, um, that we live in a kind of maze of social roles, and then our fundamental relationships of interdependency on which we all depend for our survival, right? Like, who, who picked these cherries I just ate during the breakout group, right? Who grew the hibiscus of the tea I'm drinking? Like, where does my electricity come from, right? Like all of this vast interdependence is as an impersonal system of commodity exchange. It's strangers calling out to each other in the darkness, right? And that, um, that we go and encounter each other highly mediated through these extremely alienated social roles. And then our encounters with each other don't even correspond to our actual existing interdependency at all. And that the only place where our encounters with each other and our interdependency come into alignment is within the family. And notably, the family is the most intense site of gender and sexual normalization like in society as a whole. It's the place where the expectations on you are most intensely gendered on many levels. And, you know, it's like extremely alienating in a whole different way. And so if we were to think about freedom, that there's some level which actually encountering each other, not through these sort of infinite impersonal mediations would be a, uh, would be a very powerful thing to do. And it does not happen under neoliberalism. It is not what neoliberals call the individual. It is not what humanists that are being critiqued by Afro-pessimists call the human. It is not, right, a distinction between civilized and non-civilized. It is something, it is a, a horizon of, the, of possibility yet to be discovered in human relations. What would it mean to encounter each other on the other side of class society in a way that isn't um, that isn't based on just scarcity, right? And Dalla Costa is pointing to the way this happens in the moments on the barricades, right? People meet each other at protest sites and they are transformed in that moment. They're transformed from the social roles that is expected of them, and they open onto new, fresh encounters. And I, I think a lot about how mass protest transforms people, how riots transform people, how mass occupations transform people. And I think it breaks open kind of all our ideas about the human, about the social into like actually trying to hear each other. And that really that has something to do with psychoanalysis. That psychoanalysis is like working through the vast system of resistances and transference that that prevent us from actually encountering each other on some level, encountering each other freshly. And I don't think that could actually be adequately theorized. I think definitionally in a society not in the middle of insurrection, you could only partially think about that. It cannot be thought about because it would require breaking beyond the limits of thought as we know them. And then everything that we theorize, social reproduction, the sort of systematic organization of the human as a regime of social death, the sort of how are the many ways we can theorize gender are all sort of theorizing kind of what it means to be an alienated person in class society, the world that we live in. Uh, and you know that that Frank Wilderson and others are right that that like, the only way to really talk about freedom is to talk about the end of the world. And that, that Dalla Costa is, knows that on some level in this moment, that, that like freedom would be the other side of the end of the world. And that the end of the world is necessarily being the overcoming of the family as a unit of capitalist society, as a crucial dimension of that. So like which words we wanna use, individual, person, subject, I'm not really sure. Uh, I mean, I think in each register, the sort of tension 
between the kind of vast possibilities we have yet to discover between each other and the highly alienated con maelstrom of confusion that actually constitutes our lives, that that tension is parsed differently. I do not think the object of psychoanalysis is ever the individual. It is the subject, and the subject is always socially constituted. And that, Dalla Costa says that at the end, you know, uh, in various places, but that is why we need the seminar. That is why we need to think about the family, both as an object of white supremacy and of capitalism and of psychoanalysis. And we have to think about that together because the family is where the psychic production of the individual and the immediate social relations of our upbringing and the global organization of racial capitalism all come and meet and they're all the same thing. And they're all the same thing in our unconscious, in our free associations, clinic room, right? The social bond is the constitution of the subject, right? Desire is the desire of the other. There is no individual beyond the social bond, right? It's in, in the social link that we become constituted as speaking people. And that that's, that's why we need Marxist feminism if we want to talk about uh, the clinic. That's why we need an encounter with Afro-pessimism, an encounter with communism, if we want to even begin to think about the power of, of psychoanalysis. I think that's an incredibly moving place to stop for today, as we are just one minute shy. For more time thinking with Michelle, of course, come back in two weeks, same bat time, same bat place, but also this new event. Um, I'll drop the link again in the chat um, that will be to celebrate Michelle's work, imagining a life as is yet to come. Um, and just to say that there are other new events as well uh, from the foundation and the magazine, if you wanna check them out on our homepage. Um, and please join me in thanking Michelle for just such a rigorous and moving presentation today. See you all in two weeks. Peace.